Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 27. Today, I, Mark, am here with Orion. Hey, what's up? And we are talking about the convention. We were just at the Granite Games Summit up in Nashua, New Hampshire. G2 Summit! Our first year attending. Although I think it's twice a year. I think there's another one in the fall. We get it. We don't have to wait a whole year for the next one. G3 Summit! <laughs> And it was really fun. I had a blast. This was the second kind of smaller game convention we went to in the past month. And the last one was great. This one was a little bit bigger and was also fantastic. And I am fully convinced now that the smaller conventions are a great time. Oh, it was a blast. And you actually have like space to find a table and play games. And you might even recognize someone if you go to multiple of them. So... Compared to PAX East, which we're going to in three weeks? Three weeks, I think, yeah. Where there will be, what, 20,000 people? 100,000 people? Somewhere between those two numbers. Okay. Many thousands of people compared to maybe a few hundred or fewer yeah, what, at... Yeah, 200 Conclave. at this one? Yeah. Probably. At any given time, I'm sure there were more tickets sold. My plan going in was to maybe try to network a bit because I know there were some other reviewers that are going to be there. There were publishers there, or designers showing off their games in like a designer's alley section. And I thought maybe I'll do some networking here and kind of get my name out. But then I got there. I'm like, I just want to play some games. And I think I got my name out a bit. I met some people and they kind of knew who I was, but I had a blast just playing a bunch of games. So we're going to be talking about the games that we played there. And we got some great ones. We've got some stinkers. I will I will say that there's a nice juicy rant upcoming for the middle of this podcast about a certain very popular game at the moment that we played and did not like. I'll, I'll leave it there. We did not like it. You will hear more later. Yeah, there were brilliant games. There were fun, but maybe not brilliant games. And there was at least one stinker. There was one stinker. I liked everything else we played, really. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Let's start at the beginning, and I'm doing this in chronological order just because it's easier to remember, with a game that I played but Orion didn't called Paramedics Clear. And I had never heard of this game before. I was wandering around. I saw a guy. He ended up being the publisher of the game. And he's like, hey, do you want to play a game? game? And I said, sure. And we played this real-time game about being a paramedic and it was very very fun i think it came out two years ago maybe a year and a half ago and how it worked is that you had your little ambulance car and there were six or seven different types of ailments that you had to fix on a person when they came into your ambulance well they weren't ailments they were solutions so like a cast or a bandage or a blood transfusion or, I don't remember the rest. They were, you know, actual medical things. And how you gain those things is through a very, very simple set collection. Sometimes not even a set. So it'd be like, you need a purple or an orange to get the band-aid. Or all the way up to, you need precisely two greens to get the blood pack. The key was that it's a real-time game. So in the in the first round through the deck, you have 60 seconds to do everything. And on your turn, you will have either one or two patients in the ambulance, and you have to do something to each of them for them to not die. So they might have between two and five different tokens that you need to get. And you have to do at least one each round, one of those tokens, to keep them alive. And once you complete the entire set, you draw a new card. And the tricky part is that you're managing a lot of different things. You're managing what you want to spend certain co color cards for. Because the cards themselves are just like ticket to write. It's like six different colors. And you want to manage when you want to heal someone. Because if you heal someone when there's five seconds left, you have to draw a new person from the deck. And then get one thing, one token on them before those five seconds are up. And you want to use your cards efficiently because essentially if you use all your cards, you're being the most efficient, but you want to give yourself like a cushion for the future. And they're like boxes you can hold tokens in and you can get new boxes or you can put, uh, put in big sets to get a, a rescue helicopter, which will just heal or ship someone off 
in a, in a pinch. And it was really, really well done. Kind of a simple execution, but the time frame makes it really hectic. And it's designed so that you basically play, you play in turn, but it's all consecutive. There's no pause in between. As soon as you end your turn, you start the next person's turn. And it's us- utilizing an app to do that. So I had a lot of fun. It was a really good two-player game. I'm sure it would be fun, really hectic with two-player because there's not a lot of time to actually prepare for your next turn. And I'm sure it'd be great with more people. So I really enjoyed that game. I would love to get my hands on a review copy and review that one. I was sitting at the table next to you, unfortunately doing work because it was a Friday and I had things to finish. And all I heard was a lot of scrambling and then people yelling clear every minute or so. Oh, yes. Well, the thing is you don't, I forgot to mention this. It's not like you run out of time. Oh, my turn's over. No, you have to hit the the button on the smartphone before time runs out or everyone in your ambulance dies. And then there's this whole thing where you have the backup gurney. So when you draw, when you, when you heal someone, you draw new cards for them, you pick one to go on your primary spot and if the other person has an empty spot in their backup the other one goes to their backup gurney so you can really lay the hurt on someone by selectively choosing what patients go into their ambulance so you're incentivized to keep your ambulance full but manageable yes Hmm. so it's 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 not just do things as fast as you can it's really about like managing what you have and preparing the best you can for the future in a hectic real-time game. I really enjoyed it. Next, after Orion was done with his work, we sat down and played Clank in Space, which I played at the previous convention in Connecticut for the first time, and I had played the original Clank maybe a year ago, eight months ago. This was your first time playing any of the Clank games, right? Yep. What did you think? I'm very curious. I thought it was fun. I enjoyed it. I don't know if it has a ton of staying power, but it was a thoroughly fun game. Yeah, that's become kind of my thoughts on the Clank verse of games is that they're they're fun. That's about like there's nothing super exciting about them, I think. There's nothing really bad about them. You just kind of buy a card, it's a deck builder, you buy a the card on the display that looks the best and kind of go on your merry way. The coolest thing about the game is the the meta push your luck thing where you're trying to get in and get out either before or around the same time as everyone else because if you're the straggler at the end, you can get stuck like you did uh, and, and lose the game dramatically. Yeah, so you're in... I think the original one is a traditional fantasy dungeon crawler clank in space is as you might expect on a space station and you're going through looking for these artifacts and there's some monster that's slowly waking up and attacks you periodically and if you take too much damage you die and then the catch is the more stuff you pick up the more actions you take uh, you put clank which are cubes into this mystery bag and then as the monster gets more angry he draws more cubes out of that bag every time he attacks and if your cube gets drawn you get hit so you're trying to manage you're you're trying to push how much you can get done collect good cards will without putting too many cubes in the bag and then you want to get the most loot and win but you do need to get all the way back out to the entrance and escape and the guy who won actually did not even go into the back for an artifact at all he just got a bunch of points and then escaped on time and won by, what, over 10%, right? Yeah, yeah. He, he did, had like 90-some and you had 82 or second place person at 82. Something like that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get an artifact either. In, in all the other games of Clank, or the other two games of Clank I've played, everyone has grabbed an artifact. Not everyone has made it back, but everyone's grabbed an artifact and come close. This one, movement seemed really slow compared to the other games and only one person got to to get an artifact but he didn't even win and and I pursued a strategy of mostly getting my points through cards so I really prioritized cards that gave you victory points at the end of the game and that seemed to work out all right so I think there's there's 
valid different strategies you can go with it in terms of trying to get in, do what you can and get out really fast, or trying to play the long game, or trying to get points on cards. There's a little bit of that. The problem I have with the game is that with a rotating card selection, there's not a lot of opportunity to get kind of synchronizations or, or what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, synergistic synergy. Yeah. synergy with the cards that I buy. I you I keep trying in Clank and Space because it has more synergy potential than the original from what I remember, but it's really hard to do when you have a, a random you know, rotating selection of cards. And I think in a deck building game, that really brings it down a bit. It makes it more accessible. And I think that's probably why Clank has so much, as much popularity as it does. I think, be, I think for three reasons. First of all, it's a deck builder with a board, which is somewhat novel. I think the, the push your luck part of it is, is compelling. And I think people like that. And I think just kind of the accessibility of the cards are not too complicated in their effects. Nothing compared to what Dominion does. It's more along the realms of, of Star Realms. Although yeah, it, it's, some it's of the like, stuff on the board's a bit fiddly, but the cards themselves are pretty simple. It's like halfway between Star Realms and Dominion in terms of complexity. Yeah. The, the, the biggest difference is, like you said, there's a rotating offering of cards instead of the Kingdom card piles in Dominion where you can look at them at the beginning and plan out your strategy and then adjust based on what people do. This, you really just have to make a decision each turn for what the best thing is. And you might try to target certain colors after you've played it a few times, but really you just have to kind of take the best card available, I think, and then tune your, your timing to, uh, to, to how fast you can go and how much time you have left. Yeah. I, I think those kind of, rotating displays would be better if they did a, a through the ages kind of thing where you kind of cycle out the cards that haven't been taken for a little while it yeah. would mess up in that particular case it would mess up how frequently the monster attacks so you'd have to balance it out but i think it'd be better if like one card like the you know the oldest card or whatever was removed each turn and then you got to see more cards and because we had a situation where like on the six card display, there were two cards that had been there forever because we all thought they were bad yeah. and no one wanted to take them. And then there were like three monsters that had a very high attack threshold. So for a while, no one was able to attack them. And only one of the cards was really relevant to anyone for a couple rounds. And it just kept getting chosen and replaced by a new single card. But that's not really compelling to me. Yeah, and I think you can run into that just based on you know the random order of the cards coming up but i don't know oh, overall it was fun i think it's a good game i think it's enjoyable and people should play it i think dominion is better and more elegant and has much more replayability yeah but i'm not trying to complain about clank at all no i think it's like the quintessential seven out of ten board game sure yeah that's what it feels like to me the next game we played was one of our favorites, Dominant Species, which we blasted through. It was four of us. One of the guys hadn't played before, and we got through the game in, what, two and a half hours? Less than that, I Less think. Less than two I and a half it hours? Was, it was coming up on two hours in the last round, so I think we ticked over two hours by the time we did our final turns and wrapped up scoring, but yeah, we blasted through it. I mean, we were playing quick. I wasn't concentrating that much on the game. I could have planned a bit better. But I think it's a testament to how elegant and how easy to learn that game is for how complex it is and how kind of deep strategically it is that people who aren't super competitive can get through what's normally a three to four hour game in, in nearly under two hours which was great. It was a great time. It was kind of the first kind of casual dominant species game I played where I wasn't concentrating quite as much because, you know, it was, it was the middle of the day. I'd just eaten lunch, I think, and was kind of tired, but still incredibly enjoyable. Yeah, it's a brilliant game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in this case, I came in with one strategy. I was playing the arachnids and I wanted to blush just bite anyone who came in my area and dominate a corner but then the glacier got shoved in my direction and so i had to 
you know, pivot in the middle of the game and get new elements and go across the map to somewhere else. But you can do that because there's enough different actions that you have flexibility in your strategy. You can pivot. And I ended up winning by about 20 points. Somewhere around somewhere there. In there. I did not play well. I was the mammals, which I hadn't played before. And I think I just mismanaged the early game a bit. I was in a pretty precarious position after going out of round two, maybe, where I only had a couple of species left on the board. And then from then on, I really tried to control glaciation, which I was able to, I think, all but one turn for the rest of the game. And really important dominance cards. Dom, uh, dominance, yeah, dominance, dominance cards. Yeah. That would have really harmed my position. The problem is I didn't do that second thing on the key turn when all those really powerful dominance cards came out. And that hurt a lot. I wasn't able to control those cards. There was another turn where I was able to get the first two spots on dominance and scored Cataclysm and or Catastrophe and another one that gave me a bunch of points and that really set me ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the round I'm thinking of. Oh, that was later in the game, though. That was like the third oh, yeah. and the last. Yeah, that was later in the game. But oh, it, okay. I was trying to... I, I got early in dominance most of the other rounds until then yeah. where I needed to do something to protect myself in some way because I wasn't able to get either a good variety of food types I was uh, habitable with or kind of corner off a section of the board which what I was trying to do most of the game with my dominant food type and I just wasn't able to sustain that it didn't show up on the on the random bag pools in the kind of the latter half of the game where I was able to sustain the uh the meat category and I just relied too much on those random bag pools and, and wasn't able to diversify enough I think yeah we also all lost at least two elements over the course of the game uh, towards the beginning, actually, which makes it hard to spread out. Yeah, yeah. So everyone kind of had their corner until the last two rounds, I think, when you kind of took over the one corner. Yeah. And I, I kind of stayed where I was, and I got a modest amount of points, and I was able to score what I needed to and didn't give other people dominance cards, but it wasn't it wasn't enough momentum to, to do well. But still such a brilliant game. Everything works so well together. It was easy to teach. Even, even though the guy was like feeling overwhelmed when I was teaching it, like the play raid's really good. Everything makes logical sense. And like he asked, what, one rules question in the game or two maybe throughout the game. And it was his first time playing. Yeah. I, again, a, a lot of that is due to the player aid just telling you exactly what each action is. Yeah, it's it's just so well done, and a, a game I continue to appreciate more and more as I play it and as I think about it, because it's just a perfectly elegant, heavy Euro war game. It's It's just a perfect example of that category of game. Yeah, and I think this was probably the most casual play, given how competitive and mean this game can be at times. Yeah, and it was still really, really enjoyable, but it would have been equally enjoyable as enjoyable if we had spent some more time and really thought through everything a lot. Because I know there were a couple of times I'm like, oh, that was a bad move in hindsight when everything was resolving. But yeah, still great. Yep. Still love Dominant Species. Which was a striking contrast to the next game we played, which was the final game of the first day. And we got pulled into a game of Rising Sun. We were looking around. Someone's like, hey, we need two people for Rising Sun. And I was like, sure. I didn't plan on buying it. So this was a perfect time as ever to get in on this game, which has been super hot. And it wasn't even like disappointment by the end. It was more like anger. <laughs> anger at that game. <laughs> it was... A terrible experience, and I hated playing it. Yeah. I Hate might be a strong word for me. I I very disliked playing that game. And if any of the people we played with are listening, it wasn't you guys. You guys were fine. You were a good group to game with. It, I, it's the game. I I think, and I've only played this in, in Blood Rage, but I think I just don't like Eric Lang's designs. I think he likes things in games that I fundamentally do not like, namely chaos. 
Like he enjoys the chaotic aspects of gaming, the kind of cosmic encounter style design where you have big powers and big dramatic swings. But to me, I never feel in control of it as much as I should in that kind of game. And that ends up being very frustrating. Let's talk about Rising Sun. We played with the pimped out super crazy Kickstarter version, which had this really nice feeling matte board. And by matte, I mean it was like a roll, like a like a like a giant neoprene. player mat for yeah. a card game or something. Yeah, it was but, neoprene. Uh, what like three by four feet or something? It was huge. Yeah, yeah, and, and looked impressive on there, but visually incredibly busy. I thought the map, it was decently clear but once you put a bunch of minis on it and stuff i thought it looked very busy visually yeah i think that was more the minis uh the map on its own was fine i spent a little bit of time looking at it trying to make sure i understood where the sea routes were to connect which regions Mm -hmm. but other than that everything on the on the map or the the mat really was fine i thought yeah and 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 as a Simon game, it had tons and tons of minis, and these were the exclusive Kickstarter ones, I think. A bunch of giant creatures and stuff. And so at first it was really... Imp- and, I, and I guess it is very impressive. Like, the production of it is very impressive. There's a lot of plastic. The minis are, are really well done in terms of being detailed and... And big. And big and... Yeah, detailed and big, I guess, is the way to go. And, and and by themselves, interesting designs. From a visual standpoint, though, by the time we got into the heart of that game, it was just a chaotic visual mess to me. Like, things didn't make sense on the board. It was extremely difficult to understand how powerful someone was in a particular region. And in an area control game, that's like the most important information you need to know. And it's just because of all those minis. It just doesn't make sense. And when you compare it to Dominant Species, which I think looks beautiful, but I know some people have visual complaints about, at least when you have a bunch of cubes, you can easily tell who has the most cubes in a region. And because as those cones, you can easily tell who has dominance. In Rising Sun, someone could have three giant creatures on the board, and they have the same strength as one of your little dudes. And there's nothing on them to indicate how strong anything is, except for the card that the person has. But if they're sitting across the table, you can't see that card. And so you have to either like memorize all of the special units, or just constantly ask how much strength someone has in a region. Which, again, in, a, in an area control game is the most important information to display from the board. And so uh, that frustrated me so much, just the visuals of it, how chaotic it was visually, and how it looked cool, I guess, but it didn't contribute to actually playing the game. It's the sort of thing where when you see it across the room, you're like, whoa, look at all those minis, that game must be awesome. And then when you play it, you're like, I have no idea what's going on because there's no consistent theme or uh, information passed with the design and size and colors of any of the minis. They're just, you have six little guys, which are your base troops, but you also have your leader who is exactly the same shape and color except for a base. And then you have your priests who are, again, the same thing except for a base and then you have these enormous monsters. Some of them might be five power. Some of them might be one power. But there's nothing indicative in the model or the design to tell you what the monster does, what it's related to, how strong it is. And so you're constantly saying, how strong is that monster? What does that monster do? What does that monster do? And it, I don't know. It's just some of the battles I actually didn't even realize there was a battle because I couldn't see the enemy mini behind my ogre or oni or whatever they were called. Yeah, and that's it gets really frustrating and I get it if like someone really enjoys painting minis, but at that point like you may I'd as get well, in I'd get into a miniatures play, game. Play Warhammer if you want cool minis. Yeah, or or any game in that style yeah. where you're collecting the minis. Like we have Armada, those are pre-painted, but like there are lots of games like that 
And I guess, you know, that's more of a commitment to fine play times, but there's got to be some middle ground here in terms of how to visually portray information while still having cool minis. And granted, I think Blood Rage does it a lot better. There aren't as many creatures in, in Blood Rage, but I think generally the bigger ones are more powerful. There's not as many. There, I think there are like three sizes, and the big ones are always at least three power. So there's there's some consistency there, and it's easier to differentiate. Well, I think it's easier to differentiate your clan leader there, and then there are there are small monsters which are usually one to two power or conditionally more, and then there are big monsters which are three or more power usually. Yeah, and so there again, there like you can at least estimate be like, I think I have more stuff there, without yeah. needing to count. Whereas in Rising Sun, they can have four enormous things, but that's only four power, and you might have one medium-sized monster with a, bo- bo- with a boost that is more powerful than all of those put together. And, and I haven't played Blood Rage for a while, but I remember almost all, if not all, of the creatures had an effect in combat. Like, they were relevant to combat. I know in Rising Sun, at least the creatures that were purchased, which I think was the... We were playing a six-player game. I think it was the majority or nearly all of them. All, were, I'd say over half had no relevance to the combat. Yeah. They had other powers that did things in other parts of the game. But to me, if you have a giant creature on the battlefield, it would be relevant to fighting. It's like commits the same way. Like, I guess that game's all fighting, but like when you get a creature, it is more powerful. Yeah, and it visually stands out on the on the board and you can see, oh, they have that cool beetle that's they're probably good at attacking. Yeah. Whereas, you know, anyways, we we've we've Yeah, we've hit we've gone on, on the minis enough. Let's talk about how it actually plays. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk in more detail about how it actually plays. Okay, so there's a there there are five actions in the game. Uh, and there's a deck of these ten tiles, so two two of each action, which are shuffled together. I gotta say though, those tiles, those best tiles component nice. of the game. Oh yeah, those were great components. <laughs> I hope those are in the actual game, not just a Kickstarter exclusive. I bet they're cardboard in the real, in like the retail game, probably. But the the plastic, they felt like uh, mahjong tiles almost, or dominoes, or, or something. dominoes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's a you know there's your your basic actions. There's a recruit. There's a move armies. There's a gather resources. Which what's the other one I'm missing? Uh, getting a card. Oh yeah, Bu- buying, buy- card. buying cards, and then there's the betrayal one. And the game is really is people try to sell it as this negotiation game, and there's a little bit of that. At the beginning, there's this tea ceremony phase where you choose an alliance for the the round, and the benefit is that you get the upgraded version of the action your ally plays, and you know vice versa for them. But in a six-player game, only the first player gets two actions, so you're basic. You're you're getting one upgraded action, unless you're allied with the first person. And what is it? Only one of the two of the two, of the five only, are only two, significant. Only two are significant. the The recruit gives you one extra troop. The buy cards. What was it? Trade. I think it was called. It gives you, gives you, one, you a, discount. A one discount, and things range from zero to four. So it's it's not an insignificant discount. It's not like a 1 out of 15, but it's just a marginal thing. The only ones that are kind of a unique bonus is the muster lets you also build another castle, which improves your gives you an extra recruitment in the future. And the harvest lets you actually gather the resources for the lands where that you're in, uh, whereas the basic version of it is just everyone gets a coin. Yeah, so... When you're allied with someone, you really kind of want to set yourself up to do one of those two on your turn or on your ally's turn, which I guess could be interesting. But in our six player game, it was just a matter of there wasn't a lot of strategic thinking in, okay, what action do we play? First of all, it's slightly randomized because you draw four tiles and choose one. All but one round, I think pretty much everyone was able to get the tile they wanted but there's only three rounds. There was oh fair. Yeah, I know the. Uh, it seems so much longer. <laughs> the the guy that played the turtle race couldn't get what he wanted every time. I think or oh, until really? the third round. I know the third round. You and I were both stuck in choosing a sub an action that we didn't really want to do. Yeah, 
and I really needed Recruit to come out in the third round, but it was the eighth and ninth tile in the deck, which is just, there's nothing you can do about that. Right, yeah. And Be- so... Because you take four from the top, consider them, choose one to play, and you put them back on top. Right, so the next person's only getting one new one that you hadn't seen. Right. And I don't see the point of that necessarily. I mean, it makes a it, it tweaks the game up and you know makes it a little bit more uncertain, I suppose. But I don't see the benefit from that mechanism, rather than you know just allowing someone to play the action they want or some putting some other small restriction on it. I suppose. I don't know. I'd have to play it again to get a better understanding of that. The alliances didn't feel powerful enough. Yeah, the only it it made two differences to the game. One was you get the upgraded version of your allies' action, and the second one was if you were in the same region, you didn't fight each other. You couldn't work together, and in, in a fight, you just didn't kill each other if you happened to both be in the same region, and it just felt underwhelming in our game. Two players just kind of arbitrarily teamed up and then stayed allies for the rest of the game and just traded between themselves. And then the other four of us were in a couple different pairs of alliances. I intentionally tried to ally with the first player the first round to get the two allied actions. Sure. And then the second round, there was, I don't know, there's just, there's no strategic reason that I saw or no compelling reason to choose one ally versus another. Yeah, it, and there's it's, not it's much a marginal benefit. benefit. There's a marginal benefit to being you, an ally with you someone. You get a random bonus from an action they do. Yeah. Because you don't know what action they're going to do when you form the alliance. And you don't even know what tiles they draw to be able to play. And then there's actually a benefit in some senses to not being allied with anyone. Because when you play the betrayal card, you're not betraying anyone. So you don't lose honor, which I'll get to in a bit. And you get that powerful action, which lets you swap out two of your units for two of someone else's units, which is, in terms of, like, map strength, the most significant of the basic actions. Let's talk about the honor thing, because, again, it's a cool concept that doesn't... It's not executed well, I think. There's this honor track, which is basically... You can think of it like initiative, in terms of one player's at the top, and then you can do certain things to move up or down one tier or one rank in honor you you have a certain starting honor and then lots of different actions will move you up and down but the problem at least the way i saw it is that it's used too much it's the tiebreaker for everything in the game and the numbers that you're competing over generally range from like one to five or so right there are a lot of ties and there's a lot of ties and so this honor track it's just like a tiebreaker should come into account when people are actually close and the same, not every other interaction. Yeah, and, and the problem I had with it was that I started at a high honor, which was, I think, kind of a balancing thing for my particular clan. And by the end of the first round, I had gone from second place to second to last place by literally doing nothing with honor. It was just everyone else manipulating honor so much over that first round that I dropped almost to the very bottom. Yeah, I dropped to the bottom and then didn't bother trying to fight it back up. And I kept trying to fight it back up because I had taken cards early that helped me with honor. And that gave me passive bonuses for having honor. Well, and that was the whole point of my clan also, is that whenever I won a tie break, I I got to steal a coin and a victory point from the person I tied with yeah so i went in wanting honor but i did everything i could possibly do to gain honor in that game and i think i I was in the middle to middle bottom the whole time and some of that is that there are the a, a couple extremely powerful cards that you can buy and we happened to be at the end of the turn order i think you were fifth i was sixth mm-hmm. uh the first round and so the first time the card buying went up we got middle or last pick and the card there there was one card that said every time you buy something or every time you give away a coin you get an honor and a victory point or something right and the 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 first or the second guy in the in the rotation bought that immediately and his race started at the very bottom and they're supposed to be this dishonorable kind of poor race 
but with that he just immediately was the top honor and stayed there most of the game because every action he did he gained an honor yeah and i suppose it's the kind of thing where you could say well once you know the cards better you'll be able to pivot you know and and plan around these things but there's so much visually going on and so many different powers that I don't want to learn those cards. Like I don't want to learn those abilities because ultimately it feels so much out of my control whether or not I get it. Because that guy gets that card only because the... He randomly sat next to the first player. Yeah, he randomly sat next to the first player. And I tried my best with what I was able to control and so much of that game felt outside of my control that it was, it, it was just frustrating. Following along with that, the combat is, well, I didn't like any of the actions in combat, but the the combat is determined by secretly bidding. All the participants in the battle will secretly bid on each of these four actions before, and then you reveal and resolve. So whoever had the most, ties broken by honor, of course, for each of those four things got to do it, and everyone else did not get to do the action. I like kind of blind bidding kinds of things, and I think Comet does it very well. And and I'm comparing this Comet because, again, like Blood Rage, it's, it seems to borrow a lot of inspiration from Comet, but then just makes it worse. And so I like the kind of poker game blind bidding thing you do with cards in Comet. This one, not only did it take five, ten times longer... It was just frustrating because if you if you fail, you just l- lose. You just don't get anything. It's sold as this like cool. Oh, even if you're the underdog, you can outplay the other person and outthink them in your secret bidding. But it doesn't really work that way. It's just if you get lucky and bid on the thing that they don't, maybe you win. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just really bad at this. But there were a couple times where I should have put one coin differently. And ended up losing the entire battle and my army and got nothing out of it and lost all my money. Yeah. And I can see how, in theory, it might be interesting. Because you have a couple axes you're fighting over. First, whether or not who wins the battle, which can turn into victory points by the end of the game. And then secondly, who scores the battle which doesn't necessarily have to be the winner. So there's a, one of the things is who gets points for each death that happens in that battle. And that could be any of the participants. And then you had this other kind of mini game going on with taking people hostage, which didn't help on either of those two things, but it did give you a little bit of points and extra money going into the next round. It gave you marginal strength in the combat because you basically removed one of your opponent's pieces. Right, but you couldn't profit from it because they weren't killed. You could profit insofar as it helps you win the battle, but not getting the points from the battle. But you also stole a point from the person you took hostage. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's technically better, I guess, than, than getting the points from the battle. And it wasn't compelling to me. I ended up playing a strategy where I just gathered lots of money so I was able to kind of win whatever I wanted and even then I never felt like I was turning it into much points unless until like the end of the game where I kind of had an ability where I could take two hostages and I got some points out of that but other people just because of the cards they were able to get were able to kind of turn those cards into points through the battle system but the battle system by itself didn't do a whole lot it just felt like a weird chaotic mess kind of of and it took so long yeah like this whole game it's three rounds it's like 21 actions and three battle resolution phases it took what three and a half hours for us yeah man i'd rather i'd rather play dominant species again and then another half in less time yeah and in that game's chaotic but you feel like first of all you feel like you know what's going on and secondly, you feel like you have some control to outwit and outpivot other people. This one felt like we got hosed because we happened to, to sit to the right of the person who's, who was first in turn order. And therefore, we got fewer action selections. And just by random, dumb, not 
luck, but just, I, I guess luck, just like you said, putting one fewer coin than you should have to make a huge victory point difference in the bidding. And you could argue that I should have played differently and made a point to acquire more money throughout the game, but I was, I don't know, I hadn't played before and I didn't know what was important, partially because it's a new game and partially because it's very opaque just from the design and then i was just in a horrible situation based on seat location and there's nothing to mitigate that yeah the game i mean i i can see if you slim down that game to like an hour hour 15 minute game it might be interesting but it feels so bloated and so overproduced and there's so many things tacked onto it that you're making relatively few interesting decisions compared to the amount of annoying downtime and uncertainty you have like compare it to like any other tableau builder because ultimately it's kind of a tableau builder because you're getting most of your power and most of your victory points from the cards you get which includes the creatures and like i spent three and a half hours and i had a tableau of like six cards and that's not interesting like we can play race for the galaxy and get a tableau of 12 cards you know with interesting equally interesting effects and get that over with in 40 minutes like that's what it felt like to me it felt like that kind of thing with a little bit of area control and then it took three and a half hours yeah i think i mean we've talked about a lot of different both design and mechanics that we didn't like but in terms of just gameplay the thing that really got to me was that Almost everything in the game was chaotic and had a ton of randomness built in. And the downside of losing in one of those random outcomes was extremely punishing. So if you happen to lose a battle, you lose your entire force and you get no recompense. You get, well, like, you get like a couple coins. You get a couple coins from the victor based on how many they spent. Um, it's It's not much. Which, that was... Probably the best part of the battle system. It was a, it was a, I think it's interesting an interesting mechanism. Thing yeah, of, yeah. If you want, you can spend a lot of money to try to win, but then your opponents get the money and can maybe win in a future battle. But it was just there were so many actions that there were so many things that happened that were outside of my control that came down to me having lower honor than someone and just getting wiped out because of it. Yeah, and and when you compare it to games that are similar to that game like dominant species, like the decisions you're making and the amount you can outwit players and outthink players and play really cleverly is just beyond what I saw in Rising Sun in that play. Like and so much more. And it's the the choices you make are dwarfed by the randomness. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you like area control and maybe you don't want the chaos, like El Grande is a really, really elegant design and area control. Like I would go to those two games a million times before going back to Rising Sun. I don't even want to like put in the effort to try to play it again and maybe get a first impression out. I just, it was, it was such a disappointing, just tedious experience that I don't want to repeat. Yeah, I have no desire to play that game again. Well, let's move on to happier times then. And I want to talk about a prototype that I played called Deck Construction, which is the guy I was playing with the designer. He said that it might be out by the end of this year. And it is a dexterity kind of game. It's about card stacking. And it's a game in which you have a deck of cards and they're nice thick cards for the stacking aspect. And you have this foundation, which is, I don't know, five or say six by six inches with a little kind of cross thing in the middle sticking up so you can lean cards against it. And what you're doing is, on one hand, you're trying to collect a set of five different blueprints. And you get that just by drawing throughout the game. You just draw cards. If you draw a blueprint you don't have, you get it. And then every turn, you also need to place a card on this construction that you're collectively building. And each of the cards will have one of three instructions on them, either flat, sideways, or vertical. And you need to place the card that way. 
And if you place it above the foundation level, you get a coin. If you place it above the foundation level and the card you place is the highest point of the construction, you get two coins. And what happens is you keep going around doing this. And if you accidentally knock a card over or multiple cards over, you get punished a bit. But once someone hits either all five of their blueprints or seven coins, they have to then in order put all of their blueprint cards on the construction. So you'll be putting up to five cards back to back to back on this construction and they have to be mostly above the foundation. So it creates this really cool end game where everyone's holding their breath, literally, because I accidentally blew over the house at one point by exhaling in relief. And that was hilarious. But everyone's holding their breath watching this person do this kind of finale to the construction. And it's that Jenga kind of thing where you have the tension of not wanting to knock something over, but it's more delicate. You have the cards and... You don't have the annoying like pre-assembly of Jenga, which was always a pain because you're building up as you play the game. I enjoyed it a lot. I really want to get my hands on it when it comes out. And I recommend you kind of keep your eyes open because as a dexterity game, that was just an absolute blast. It was really well done in terms of the mechanisms of kind of keeping everyone involved in the game and then putting this huge burden on the on the person going for the win to kind of do the finale. And it was tense and exciting and, and hilarious when you knock something over and just a lot of fun. I, I really liked that game. And I don't, I, I wouldn't have thought I'd be predisposed to like that kind of game, but when I sat down to play it, it was an absolute blast. Meanwhile, (laughs) I was still reading the rules for Here I Stand. Which we played next. For the rest of the day. (laughs) Yes, Here I Stand, the epic wars and politics and religious conflicts during the Reformation game from GMT, uh, designer Ed Beach, which we'd played once before, found it really interesting and have been dying to play it again. And we got to play it again. We did the short scenario, three people again. The game is... Basically, you can play with three or six people. There are other modes, but they don't seem quite as good for different player counts. Ideally, you want to play at six. But we played at three, and just as good as I remember. Yeah, it's it's just so good. It's just so good. It's hard. It's it's got the biggest rule book or most complicated rules I think of any game we've played. Yeah, I think forty four pages. Yeah, which Orion has. I don't know if I if I asked you to do it. I don't know, but I'm well, glad no. you're the one learning the rules and not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a game that we've talked about for a couple years now, I think, and then it came on P500 last year, and I got it, and the 500th anniversary 500th dis- and- edition. Yeah, yeah. And so I read the rules and got it, kind of kind of pushed through the the first play, and then refreshed myself and and taught uh, another guy for the uh, the third the second play here but it's just there's so much going on you've got six completely asymmetrical factions you're all competing over these key victory point cities but then you also have a completely unique different uh, other thing that you're doing or multiple things to get victory points so the protestants are really just focused on spreading and converting as much of Europe from Catholic to Protestant as they can. Whereas the Ottomans don't care at all about religion and only want to pirate the Mediterranean as much as they can and win a war here or there. Yeah, the asymmetry is is wonderful, and it it does two things. First, it makes everything kind of more interesting because everyone's concentrating on different axes of victory. But it also makes the game feel more epic because... Like you said, as the Ottomans, like you don't care about part of the game at all. And a game that has the space to let you not care about parts of the game without harming the experience at all and making the Ottomans like not feel like they're kind of a half-baked faction or something is tremendous because it really feels like you're playing through history. The Ottomans really didn't care about the Reformation. They cared about getting... Was it, they, Vienna. They, they were they trying to, to conquer Vienna for yeah. 200 years. They tried to conquer Vienna. Yeah. And in our particular game, you conquered Vienna on the first play of the game. Oh, through yeah. Through a tremendous stroke of luck that sustained throughout the entire game. 
Yeah, the other theme of this play was my incredible dice rolling. I'm pretty sure my average die roll was probably about a 4.2 or maybe 4.5. Yeah, it was, and, and card drawing. Like, you got some high point cards and a couple of good combos you wanted. Yeah, I played France and the Ottomans, and France consistently had usually two other five point cards in their hand. Yeah, it, it was. It was a truly remarkable feat of luck. And to be fair, if if Art and I had played better ganging up against you, we probably could have extended the game a lot more. Because we, we did not play very well on top of having bad luck. And so I don't think the game's too swingy in that regard. And I think a lot of the problems we had would have been resolved in a six-player game where there's a lot more room to make negotiations and deals and such. Uh, right, to it's kind the, of balance it's the, the game same out. Sort of like one of those big six-player diplomacy-ish games, you know, Twilight Imperium comes to mind, where a lot of the balancing factor is the people sitting around the table all trying to win. Right. Yeah. Any any kind of any kind of multiplayer combat game is going to have that. Looking back, the game doesn't seem that difficult, which is weird. Which is funny because it has a huge rule book and a lot of intricate rules. But it has a lot of, well, it, it's more that it just, it has a large scope and there are details in each scope, but you can understand all of them in separately. Right. They all mostly the rules, make sense. The rules aren't that complicated. It's just there's more game here. There's just a lot of rules. Like it's not any more complicated than the, one of the coin games. I'd say on a kind of, if you ignore the scope, maybe a hair more complicated than Triumph and Tragedy. But I'd say on the level of the coin games, it's just, there's twice as many things you can do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of, like, side games going on. And not to make those any less important, because they all work together to form the game. It's just that some nations are focused on colonizing and exploring the new world, and then other nations don't care at all and are just trying to flip religion in Europe. And then the Papacy and the Protestants are going off and having debates and burning each other at the stake. Well, I shouldn't say... Only the Catholics oh. do that, Ryan. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> the Protestants just shun people. They, they shame the pro uh, Catholic debaters so much that they just have to go into retirement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. In, in that sense, it's kind of like vast where you... You really only need to learn your faction, and there's some overlap. It's not as extreme as vast, but like the entire thing to do with debates and converting religion in particular areas, you only need to know if you're the papacy or the Protestants, and you only need to know about colonizing if you're England, France, or the Habsburgs. 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 Yep. Yeah. So some of those mini games, like you could just go without learning like the first time we played i played the uh you played france and the ottomans yeah and france and the ottomans ignored and, the religion and i never learned the religion rules i had to learn them from scratch into this play because i was playing the protestants in england so you can kind of divide the labor that way and it wouldn't hurt that much strategically to not know about the little mini games that you are not directly involved in but it's hard to explain right now why this game is so fun to me. Like, it's complicated. It's got a lot going on. It has things I like. It, it's a card-driven game, so you can play the card for the event or the points. I think it's just the scope of it, the scale of it, and the feeling you get of actually playing out big historical battles. More than any other game, even ones that have the same geographical scope, like Axis and Allies, like, when I crossed the channel to try to take over one of the French cities and then march into Paris, like, that felt really significant. And it was only, like, moving, a, you know, some guys two spaces on the board, but it requires so much preparation and kind of gearing your whole turn around doing that thing that it feels more significant and more powerful and more kind of real-life historical than in other games of this type. I guess that's a testament to the mechanisms themselves, like, that you do have to plan out campaigns that way because everything has to retreat back into a stronghold area at the end of the round. Like, like little rules like that help the experience, I think, be what it is. 
Yeah, it's a game where there's a, a lot of mechanisms, but they contribute to the experience instead of muddying it. Yeah, yeah. That might be the, the closer on that game. Here I stand, it's an incredible experience. If you have the opportunity to play, do not pass it up. It yeah. takes all day. It's a commitment. You just it'll know take, that going in. It'll take an hour or more to learn the rules, but totally worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we're planning a six-player game in uh, two weeks, and uh, I, I'm already excited. I can't wait. I cannot wait to do it. I'm, I'm super excited. I want to play the Protestants again. I want to really do well with them. They're, they're so fascinating. So that was what we played most of the second day of the con. And yeah, then that was for, Saturday. <laughs> yeah. For Sunday, we got there a little late because the daylight savings time is annoying. Ah, as HQ taught us, it's daylight saving time. That's true. HQ trivia throwing on those useless facts. We got there, though, and we had time for one long game, basically. And we played Lisboa, which is our third Vitos Lacerda game that we've played. We own Venus, and we have played the Gallerist. I played it a couple of times. And then finally, we got to play Lisboa, which is his newest game. And from what I've heard, the most complicated of, of all of his at least it's the most complicated of those three, and you crushed at it, Orion. Okay, just uh, <laughs> yes, I did. I won like one hundred. You nearly doubled everyone. I think else's I won one hundred twenty to seventy-five or something like that. So yeah. it was the beatdown. But this is just—it's a cracking game. Like it's just—it's a slam dunk. It's like the the three <laughs> we've played. They're just—they're all—they're all great games. Do you like this one the best? I don't even know. I think I like. I think. I think I might like Venus the least, but that's not degrading Venus. That's just how much I enjoyed these other two. Yeah, Lisboa was a lot to get my head around. Like all of his games, though, everything is connected to everything else. So it's hard It's hard to do the first play of the Lacerda game. The second play is going to be amazing because it's all kind of intuitive once you know it. But it's hard to kind of figure out how things interact with each other. And this one more so. Cause, so you have like three primary actions you can do. But the whole theme of the game is about rebuilding the city of Lisboa after it got devastated by a bunch of natural disasters. And so one of the main things you can do is build stores, which will help you get goods. The second thing you can do, the second primary action is building public buildings which will help you get victory points through your store placement in this kind of grid and help you get rubble cubes which help you kind of build a small little engine and be able to do more things essentially but then you have this whole mini game where you're shipping your goods but you have to buy the ships to do that and that will help you get money but to turn that into victory points you kind of have to be the owner of the ship but then the third main action is just getting cards that give you victory points for things. So, like, there's a huge deck, probably, what, 60 cards or something? Yeah, thereabouts. That give you endgame victory point bonuses, and you can just get them throughout the game. What am I missing? There's the shipping with the goods to get money and also some victory points. There's the whole end of round things. There's a little track with a monk, I think, that can give you passive bonuses. But that's just like what you end up doing. There's also this whole card play thing where on your turn you play a card and then there's this whole influence track that lets you activate certain things based on how many people have done that action before. And then other people can get tokens that let them follow you on that action. I'm not, I'm, I've got probably two thirds of it, but there's a lot going on in this game and it all relies on knowing something else about the game. And the okay, there's yeah. basically there's basically three areas to the game. There's the city grid where you're building the rebuilding stores and the public buildings. Right. The stores will generate goods for you later, and the public buildings give you victory points. Both of those give you the rubble cubes, which essentially increase your hand size and your your good, tableau size. Your, your, yeah, your tableau size and your uh, good storage capacity. Oh, yeah, that's right. And then the other half of the game is the court. So there's the the three different 
I don't even remember their names. There's three different magistrates you can go to, like the king, the uh, the clergy guy, and the builder. The builder, the builder guy. I, I don't. Yeah. It doesn't matter. There's the the green, pink, and the blue <laughs> magistrate. And so you can play cards to activate their actions. You can play cards in two ways. One costs you influence. One gives you a little bonus. Uh, one costs you influence, but gives you their main action. The other way lets you do two of the minor actions, but does not cost influence and gives you another bonus for playing it. But it does cost goods. It does cost goods. And then when you play a card... If you play it into your tableau, you can either go trade with the nobles, essentially bribe them with goods to do their minor actions, or you can ship your goods on a, a ship. Right. Or you can play the card into the court to activate their major action and one of their minor actions, and you visit a specific magistrate instead of trading with any two. Yeah, and, it, and it's it's a game where, at least in that first play, and I know it's going to be a lot better in the second play for me, you, you grasped it better than I did. But it's one of those games where you're like, okay, I'm just going to try to make this simple. What do I want to do now? I want to build a public building. Okay, what do I have to do to that? Well, I need to utilize that I want to build a store. So I got to build a store first. Okay, and you, and you I want to do the store thing. So okay. I need workers to go out there, which means I need to play the green card. But I also need influence to be able to do that because other people have workers out there. I also need money to be able to afford the afford store. The store. Yeah. So how do I get money? Well, I got to ship goods. How do I get goods? Well, I need stores to get goods. And so everything's kind of cyclical like that. And you may have a plan to do something that you want, but find out that it's going to take like four steps to get there. And then you have to reevaluate, is it worth doing those four steps? What could I be doing in the meantime instead to do that? Or can I kind of build up resources as I get to my ultimate goal? Plus, there's the whole, like, they may take the store location you want. There's a lot of competing over that and the different public building locations and certain cards in the card display for endgame points. And getting an architect blueprint for to build the public building. Oh, yeah, the blueprints. Ooh, yeah. The point is that it's it's a fairly heavy game in terms of complexity, and there's a lot of systems that all work together, and there's a lot of kind of internal feedback loops that you have to be able to navigate. And I think a good player will have the foresight to know how to set themselves up for actions in the future and have room to take, the, take advantage of something that comes up. Because one of the other mechanics is that you can get these favor tokens that lets you follow on when someone else goes to court, you can follow and also do one of the actions. Instead of having to play the card, you basically get an extra turn, like an extra half turn. Right. And so things like utilizing those well and managing your money and goods kind of cash flow, so to speak, are going to be the keys to um, to succeeding. Yeah, it, it's similar to kind of how in Scythe you end up planning ahead a bunch of turns and you do this and you do this, and your ultimate goal is trying to just maximize the efficiency of doing the bottom row actions. It's like that, but there's a lot more interference in what you end up doing based on what other players do, and it's just like twice as complicated in terms of what you need to think through to plan ahead and effectively get more for each action. And yet at the same time, your turn is just playing a card to your tableau or playing a card in the court. Yeah, it, it starts with that, but it ends up the consequences of that could be significant. It yeah. could result in a lot of little things happening if you play it right. So really, really interesting game. I got to play it a second time. I, I commented to some of the uh, patrons from uh, that are supporting on our, on our Discord that the best... Lacerda game is the Lacerda game you've played second most recently. So you've played for the second time. Because I don't know if Lisboa is a little too opaque for me or if I'm just going to get it now the second time. I think based on my previous experiences, I'm going to get it a bit more. You'll definitely it, get it more. but Yeah, I don't know how it's going to end up going. But I really want to play it again while I still have the rules fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can say... I enjoyed this. I enjoyed the gallerist that we played uh, last month. 
I want to buy both of them, but they're out of stock and right now, so I'm trying to figure out which one I want more. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're so good. And now I just want to play his earlier games because he has six total out, I think. I want to play Kanban. I want to which, play... uh, which Art said was his favorite, right? Yeah, he said that's his favorite, so we'll have to get together with him to play that. The new edition of CO2 is coming out within the next few months, I think, which is his semi-cooperative or fully cooperative game about pollution, and looks interesting. Okay. At this point, I'll play anything this guy makes, because it's... Yeah, I mean, I've played... There's such tight, solid designs. I've played three of his games, they've all been great, and he's like he's made the safe list now of i'll give him the benefit of a doubt when a new game comes out that i will probably like it or at least i don't know i i expect it to be good I guess. yeah it's like you know if we wanted to try a new coin game we'd expect it to be good if, or a if, new vlada game yeah. a new vlada game other than the little tiny like party icebreaker one he just come out with i didn't i wasn't really interested in that yeah it's kind of like the circle of trust where you know they don't have to sell you per se it's yeah. like just the name there is a selling point. Yeah, and there are few, only a few designers where I would say that's true. And he has absolutely earned his spot there. Well, that concludes what we played at the Granite Games Summit. And other than Rising Sun, a really, really solid collection of games there that I would definitely recommend. And I cannot wait to get to the fall one. Whenever that's going to happen, I think I'll make this a, a biannual trip. I don't want to miss any of them because it was just a blast. Yeah, it was great. And we didn't really do any of the other events, but they had big code names they, going on. They had two rooms and a boom running all evening. Trivia. Trivia. They had raffles. They had a mini escape room. They had different tournaments. There's a lot of other stuff going on if you you know don't necessarily know games you can just go do fun things there and meet people and then end up playing games yeah so if you're in the new england area look up the granite games summit again it's in nashua new hampshire and if you do end up going to the next one let me know and i'll say hi to you there or say hi to me if you can find me and just a great time really well organized we know i know kind of the organizers i've met them before and they're great people and they did a fantastic job at this event and i i'm gonna keep coming back but that's our podcast for today we will be back in a couple of weeks talking about something i'm not sure we got a plan on that don't forget to look at the thoughtfulgamer.com for all the reviews and other writings i have Hit me up on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. Let me know what you thought of the podcast. And if you do enjoy the podcast and want to watch it recorded live, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. If you become a patron, you get access to the live feed of the podcast and get to uh, watch us make all kinds of mistakes that ended up being edited out. And we'll chat with you if you say stuff in the chat. And 100% guaranteed appearance of our cat if you also like the podcast you can like rate and review it on itunes oh yeah i forgot that one i thought i had them all i was really proud of myself orion you did good i did do pretty well anyways we'll talk to you all next time goodbye peace out <laughs>